here. All right. It is live recording. All right, guys. So let's hope that this works. Um, oh, sweet. It did. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So can everyone see that? Cool. Just All remember, right. if, if you have um, sound on this or a video or anything, you'll want to make sure you you set that up on your screen share. The check marks to share computer audio. All right, hold on. Um, stop share. Let me get out of this then. And I should have, well, I did share screen. Oh, share computer sound. Thank you. Found it. All right. Let's share. Okay. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about it. It's very difficult. To, I'm actually more of a hands-on person. So if you don't understand something, please let me know. I am going to give this and uh, the handout, which is sort of a briefer thing, a briefer condensed version um, to um, El um, Elsie. So uh, anyway, uh, so I'm going to go ahead. Please feel free to stop because it's it's. I've got PowerPoints, um, but if you are question about some of the uh, items or the um, techniques, just give me a holler. Okay. And how does this? All right. So just cliff notes here, really quickly on history of embroidery. Uh, it's the nerd in me. Um, let's go back. So uh, anyway, embroidery was actually is actually very old. It was found um, in uh, a Neolithic, um, excuse me, um, in Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal uh, areas in in, in Europe. Um, the first one that we have really is Tutankhamun's, and uh, then we also have a lot of embroidery that came out of China. Uh, and then, which leads us uh, also to from China because they used a lot of silk and silkworms, which is actually really important to us because silk was found in in both Mama and Osberg, uh, Osberg and uh, at Burka, and has been found all over the Viking the Viking world. So uh, embroidery is not anything new to any was not anything new to any people in the medieval period um, at all. Then it was also sort of a way to uh, show uh, prestige, if you will. So if we go to the Osberg ta tapestry specifically, we can see the amount of work that went into just explaining, showing the decoration of clothing and um, how important it is. Um, a lot of it is done in silk um, in terms of the tapestries. Um, and I still use silk, although a lot of us use wool or even cotton. Uh, but uh, embroidery is found on almost every single tapestry that we have from that period of time, even including the Bayou tapestry. Uh, we can see evidence of how important uh, embroidery was. Um, and there's just a couple of more in, uh, examples right through here. And more. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, this off here. We're going to go through um, uh, the materials that you'll need for the class. Uh, since we're technically, uh, unless you have these at home and are actually doing a stitch, um, we're probably not going to really have an opportunity to kind of uh, to use this as a hands-on, although that's what I would have preferred. Um, I do have some hands-on directions on the PowerPoints that is a video, um, and but it will give you an opportunity to go through that at your leisure. Um, so typically with embroidery thread, you can use wool, silk, bamboo, cotton. If you can catch a wild polyester or wild acrylic thread, you can use that too. Um, I actually have some cow, uh, some cow uh, fibers, 
that were typically used for uh, cow hair. It was used uh, for uh, tapestries, um, and it was mixed in actually with uh, sheep's. Um, I don't typically. I use um, a round magnetic pan, uh, round magnet, especially if I'm doing the Osberg chain stitch, because it gives me one. I can put it right against another piece of metal. I don't have to worry about my O meandering all over the place, uh, and it also uh, makes my uh, pin stick. Um, but you can see examples of that as we get there. Uh, I don't always use quilter's pen or chalk. I made a mistake of using chalk on a, um, a hand woven herring, uh, herring uh, excuse me, uh, diamond twill. So a hand woven diamond twill and the chalk actually uh, got into the grooves of the fabric and it changed the fabric. Uh, so I actually use a really narrow painter's tape, which sounds a bit on the strange side, I know, but uh, I, it gives me really clean lines. I don't typically have to worry about any type of glue or residue uh, at all, um, and uh, I, can, I can move in. And so I've used like the same piece of painter's tape over and over and over again for a project. And I don't have to worry also about my, uh, my design, the, the, uh, the chalk on it getting smeared in any sort of way. Uh, optional is patience. I think embroidery is a lot of patience. Just about every piece of embroidery that I've done has taken me like hours. I, and I mean like um, one of the pieces of work that I did took at least two to 300 hours. So um, in, doing embroidery can be a very, very long process um, and you can get really sick of it really quickly. Um, so anyway, the uh, kind of stitches that we're kind of really just going to go over today are the running stitch, uh, which is there's a, a whip stitch and a line stitch and a step stitch, which can be used for a variety of different types of designs, um, including the herringbone ladder. Um, there's a mom and stitch, which is uh, close to the herringbone stitch. Uh, I'm going to show the cheat, what I call the cheater mom uh, and stitch, uh, mainly just because I haven't been able to completely, uh, I haven't learned the full mom and stitch in terms of the filing as well as I really wish I had. Um, we're not going to be covering this, but a running stitch. If you can do running stitch, you can you you can do black work because it's halfway there, and then you just go on back, and it shows on both sides. Um, so we're not going to go over black uh, black work. Uh, honestly, I am not as good as black work as a lot of other people. So you would probably just be looking at some mutated form of the black work. Um, and then couch work, and then of course the Osberg chain stitch, and, and then how we put that all together. Um, these are basic running stitches here. Easy peasy ways of decorating fabric and of making things um, look a lot more appealing. It also can really, really cover a series of sins on your work. Um, I am a go big or go home type of a person. So most of the embroidery that I do um, is very, very uh, obvious and thick, um, sort of something along the lines of this. You can see here that I, I did not, none of my stitches here are very, they're not delicate in any way, shape or form. Um, I prefer I prefer stitch work that will, um, that kind of shows a little bit more um, and provides a little bit more of a, a chunky, I guess you could say, look than anything else. Um, but also it's good for seams. This is for trim, trim again in cuffs uh, and everyone's left. Is everybody, is, <laughs> is there anybody there? Yeah. Um yeah just not having video, so it's a less of a bandwidth okay. issue for people with lower bandwidth. Gotcha, all right. I just, yeah, we haven't left you. I was just wondering, because I love talking to myself, so, <laughs> or my dogs. All righty, so uh, running stitch is fairly easy. 
Uh, you draw your pattern on a piece of paper first is what I suggest uh, what you're going to do. Uh, you don't, well, the nice thing with freehand Viking embroidery is that you don't really have to stick with your pattern. Um, you can just sort of kind of give it a round of designs. Typically when I am actually planning a piece for someone, I like to find out the things that they like. Um, so for example, um, His Highness Patrick of the Miss, of, I guess it was of, of the Miss, uh, I found out that uh, he liked Star Trek. Uh, he loved Dune. Uh, he um, loved a couple of other uh, science fiction areas. And so I literally set out to do blanket work, a blanket stitch on the cuffs that were uh, Dune colored and they kind of, they were variegated in size so that they would take on the semblance of, of uh, Dunes. Um, I used Spock blue, if you will, from Star Trek. And, uh, and so I tried to really tailor that to his and including writing in Viking ruins, uh, Excelsior, which is what Stanley used to, to yell. Uh, so in any event, I, that's my, that's what I like to do. Um, so we have here, we can see where we have, uh, aligned stitches, which are literally parallel to each other. So they, they go up and down um, after just your basic running stitch. And then we have st uh, stepped. So we have, it sort of alternates, if you will, uh, the areas. Uh, this, uh, the, can you guys see it when I move my mouse? Okay, so this right here is typically the one that is used the most for a lot of designs, including um, the uh, the ladder, the herringbone ladder. However, I've done a ladder and using the aligned uh, before going up and down, um, and that looked that looked pretty good. And then, of course, a single running stitch. And one of the things I will say that I really love about freehand embroidery and even the single running stitch is that when you're done with something and if it is un if it's not exactly what you thought it was going to be, uh, using a single running stitch and then creating a whip stitch from it um, makes it look makes it look perfect. Um, you can see right here where I uh, was marking everything in chalk. Uh, in my house, dog hair is free, so it comes with just about every single garment that I have. Uh, so you will see lots of dog hair on my items for the most part. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is the whipped running stitch. Uh, a whipped running stitch is uh, very easy to do. Um, most of these stitches uh, that I'm showing you are, are very easy to do. Um, it just takes a little bit of patience and the ability to be willing to take out your stitches. Um, if need be, but a running stitch and a whip stitch is, is one of the easiest stitches that you can do if you are not a person, if you're a person who literally, and I did teach a class one time that said, that when it started with, with this is your needle. Um, so uh, in any event, um, hold on just a second. My battery's about to die for some reason. Um, so, um, so all you have to do right here is take with your running stitch is you start at one corner, bring it up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, and that's it. So, uh, then, um, with your needle of contrasting color, uh, I'm sorry, just one second. My, I don't know why my, I'll be right back. Thank you. All right, so, um, and a whip stitch actually, uh, you can do both. This is a whip stitch right down here. 
I know you can barely see it, but there's green and then there's silver. And so it's just looped all the way through. Um, hi, baby. Uh, and then um, this one right here is a whipped back running stitch. And so we, it comes up and down and up and down. And then it goes, when I've reached the back, I've started over again and gone in the opposite direction to hold the stitch together. Uh, it adds a nice bit of contrast. This is the one where I made for, um, uh, for Patrick. And so that's the Spock blue that I used. Um, do anybody, oh shoot. Uh oh, we lost our teacher. I want to pause recording until she's able to rejoin. In terms of a uh, whip stitch, um, then uh, it provides a good simple line uh, and it has a blending of the color as it, it looks literally like it's twisted. Uh, it hasn't been twisted, but it, it does give that appearance. Um, and so these are in terms of directions on really how to do that, uh, how to bring it back uh, again, but you can see right in through here, we're just going down and back up again, then be down and up. So basically it's a single loop. All right. So uh, we're going to go over a few loops and ladders based on this, a, a step, a st stepped uh, line of embroidery and then of a uh, of an aligned uh, stitches uh, with loops. All right, so here's our basic running stitch with a herringbone ladder. So you're going to want to first create your foundation stepped running stitch. Um, First, and you can see I give uh, some examples right here. This is really the best diagram that I really found online instead of creating my own. Um, it's, it is uh, not, I did not cite it as in my sources. However, if you would like that, you can find, you can find it. It's under this uh, company right here, Kumara. Um, they do a lot of stitch work. And um, basically what you're doing is you're uh, picking a contrast color and you're working your way backwards. So your very, very first um, stitch here is going to literally start right through here. So you're gonna be bringing it up through the back. And if you notice, you miss this first stitch, which is where, this is where I always make my mistake and have to take it out and do it again. And then you go up through here, but then you're going to go backwards. So basically what you're doing is you are creating a almost a uh, almost a uh, an eight, if you will, um, as you're as you're doing it, um, and you can see right through here in terms of the stitch. Um, since I use a lot of, uh, I think actually this was made with um, wild polyester instead of wool, um, and then. It didn't, it wasn't laying very well because my stitches were too, uh, they were too far apart. And so I, I ended up basically um, running, doing a running stitch on top of it in the uh, center in order to uh, make sure that it laid flat, um, which is one of the nice things that I like about Viking embroidery is that pretty much anything goes. They liked a lot of colors and so therefore, um, um, you can, uh, a lot of my personal items, believe it or not, um, I use suit green and purple uh, herringbone pattern up on top of it. Um, so that, and then of course we have the uh, uh, Kingdom of the West colors right down here below. Um, but this is, in all of these, I would really, really recommend um, practicing a little bit, even on just plain old felt you can uh, before you get started on doing anything serious. Um, typically, to be honest with you, I tend to put all of my, <clears throat> excuse me, my embroidery on uh, square pieces of wool and such like this. Like I have a purple herringbone right through here. 
Um, and I'll tend to make a panel if I can, because that way I can take it off again. I don't want to put, you know, 50 to 60 hours into something and then have it be shredded by a Husky. And then, you know, I'm out one nice panel. Um, I did have a Husky one time eat a Venetian headpiece with beads. So um, I've never made another Venetian headpiece since for very obvious reasons. Um, so in any event, um, so in terms of taking this, uh, if you do find that you know you're, there's a, too much material, you think you've made it too far apart, then a running stitch just going across um, in the middle where they meet is, is a really good way to hold that down. Uh, this one here, I tried doing something fancy with a double where I brought it down and then back up again. I, it, not really too sure it worked very well, uh, but it's interesting. So um, I just went ahead and kept it. Um, so there's uh, another type of herringbone ladder, which is uh, through the aligned. Um, and basically right through here, you're gonna create your foundation aligned running stitches, one off you know, with a separate. Um, you could use a thumbs separation uh, or an inch if you like to measure. Um, when I can, I like using parts of my body to measure as opposed to uh, uh, um, modern day uh, measurements. Uh, and then you're going to take a contrasting and this really develops a bunch of U's. This is really good on a hem right through here. Uh, um, however, you can also, uh, instead of just the U's, you can do a herringbone ladder um, on aligned stitches. Um, it's a little bit more tricky, I found. Uh, and um, as you can see right over on this side here, um, the left-hand side kind of opens up a little bit more than, and so that gives it a greater chance of it catching on. I would have actually probably just gone through and, and tap and tap, tacked each one of those right down there. Um, just right through here, probably just with the blue. So it wouldn't have shown quite so much. Um, all right, so in terms of putting it all together for fiber elements here, I have running stitches on my seams um, on this entire piece. I have a herringbone ladder, a herringbone, herringbone. I have an aligned herringbone ladder, whip stitch and just plain old herringbone. Um, Puppies do not come with any of these following items. So, and none were harmed in the making of this. And again, this is where we get our dog hair. Free dog hair. All right. So anybody have any questions about any of that by chance? Before I move on? Okay. So the SCA for the most part, kind of has it wrong on herringbone stitches. Herringbone stitches were actually sort of, uh, they were a serge type of stitch and they were, they actually went underneath. And so on the top of it, all you would see is basically that running, that it looked like a running stitch going all the way down on the outside. We like the embellishment. I like the embellishment personally. And so for the most part, um, the herringbone stitch um, goes out on the outside. However, if you look at, um, uh, Duchess Satane, Adine, I think I've got that, I've got the pronunciation correct. Um, anyway, if you look at some of her, uh, the garb that she wears, she typically tends to uh, embroider so that her herringbone is, the, the bulk of it is on the inside. And so you just see the, the running stitch on the outside, which is more period um, uh, adept. Uh, I had a very difficult time drawing out herringbone stitch. However, I will tell you that I think it's probably other than like the running stitch, uh, a herringbone stitch in the Vi in, in Viking uh, is, probably one of the most useful and uh, varied uh, stitches uh, because you can take a herringbone stitch. You can also take these areas right through here 
and make them a lot closer so they become a V uh, and uh, which is considered a closed stitch. Uh, and then um, you can um, actually continue. It looks like I call it a cheater mom and stitch. Um, but in any event, they're very simple to do. Basically, as you can see down here, uh, and this gave the best examples on, so I did pilfer the, the web a bit, um, but it is Viking, so I raided. Um, so we can see the, I don't know where my arrow is, someplace here, there it is. Um, so if you go A, and you can see this is marked out, this is not measured out the way I've measured it out here um, at all, uh, but, this person is probably much better at judging distances. Um, so anyway, so you, with A and then you go to B, let me go back there again. Um, is to go on down, but then you go backwards and from that backwards, and that's one of the stitches that you're always going to make. You're always gonna have it make, it goes backwards. So wherever you stop, you're gonna go back again. So you always wanna take that into consideration. Otherwise your stitches are going to be really, really closed on one side and very open on another. Um, and you wanna just continue that until you have the desired le length. Um, you can really, for the herringbone, you can use any type of, of uh, material, uh, any type of fiber that you'd like to, um, including dog hair actually. So Vikings actually did use dog hair. Uh, in some of their fibers and, and wolf hair. So um, if I am actually a true Viking because I use uh, I use dog hair and everything. All right, so there are various uh, herringbone designs. So when I talk about embroidering, a lot of times to some people, they're like, I can only do herringbone. I've not been able to master anything but herringbone. Herringbone is all I can do. Herringbone is a lot. Um, if, you, if you can master herringbone, you can see all of these. This is just a single, and then we have some contrasting color. Again, uh, this is right in through here. You can see where uh, there is a, something, to, uh, a running stitch used, um, basically to tack it down. And then we have other stitches again with a herringbone. Uh, this one down here blows my mind, to be honest with you, because it is literally the same one just done in like a three-dimensional type of, of motif. Um, uh, I've also included a really great herringbone resource here that um, I've used quite a bit. Um, other herringbone, though, um, is uh, this right through here is uh, called uh, Ar Armenian, there it is. This is all a herringbone and then loops. Uh, this is Armenian stitch work embroidery, which it was, I think this stuff took me like a year to do. It was awful. I, had, I, I took it out so many times that I finally, at the sixth time, I was really concerned that I was going to destroy my fabric. And I just decided that any type of mistakes were what Bob Ross would have called happy accident and went with that one. Uh, and I just decided that, oh, well, that the only, that, that was just the way it was. Um, but if you're going on up here again, you can see there's a closed herringbone stitch here. And again, I tacked it down. Uh, and then up here I used, I tacked it down, but I also used a slight bead on it. Uh, the beads, I'm not really too sure that they were absolutely 100% um, uh, uh, historic, but, I liked it, so I did it. Um, and then right down through here, you can see where we have a variety of um, herringbone stitches again, that creates sort of a depth. Uh, so uh, don't ever underestimate, if, if you can do a running stitch and you can do a herringbone stitch, you can do a lot of different stitches. So don't underestimate you know, the value of how much you can contribute to the embellishment of your outfit. Um, by those, just those two stitches, uh, because embellishment is embellishment. And uh, so, you know, take the win on that. Um, all right, so more, some more item things that you can do with herringbone um, is um, basically loops across it. I really love doing this type of work. It is, uh, I have to count a lot. Uh, and I, 
have taken out probably more than spent more hours taking stuff out than I've put it in. But the nice thing about the herringbone included and like just like the ladder is that if I mess up with this stitch right through here, it, it's not implement it's not affecting the fabric itself in any way, shape or form it because I'm literally just looping it through the threads and right in through here, you can see where I did that. So I came up again and just went through around continuously like this. Um, and this is a very, e this, if you can just keep it simple, is a very easy thing to do because you're not piercing the fabric. So if there, there is sort of a happy accident and there's one too many happy accidents and you're thinking this is over and throwing this whole thing away, don't, you know, don't throw away your happy accident. Um, save it and see if you can't resurrect it or just pull that out um, and take a, different, a separate look. But I am, uh, like there are some times where we end up with some severe mutations due to with a uh, Viking uh, freehand embroidery, but for the most part, you know, uh, try to salvage what you've already got um, because the Vikings did. I mean, uh, stuff is hard to come by. Sort of like when you live in Alaska, everything is hard to come by. So you really have to make deal with what you have. All righty. So um, the Osberg chain stitch. Um, I found this a really, really difficult stitch, to be honest with you. Um, for this specifically, because you're using couching, a couching skill. Does everybody know what couching is? Okay. Um, I ended up taking this out. Um, the, the first time I did it, it uh, looked awful and I had square circles and I don't think that I was gonna be going through that. Um, so the things that you'll need is a thicker fiber, pins, a magnet, um, and I do have a video so that um, just on the basic, so you can see what I've done. Uh, I don't videotape very well, so please excuse if I sound like like some sort of a, anyway, I sound horrible. Uh, and my students have taught me that I sound boring. And if I, make myself sound cheerful, I sound like a serial killer. So I'm just gonna kind of go in the middle here. <laughs> so either way, so I just don't come across well on the on a video. Um, so first thing is you're gonna wanna mark a line with, with taper chalk. If you're, if you are, and you are using this type of material or something more expensive, I would recommend against using chalk if you can. Um, the fiber, the, the powder gets into the fiber, it changes the color of it. Um, and the painter's tape, to be honest with you, doesn't leave much of a residue at all. Uh, and if it, uh, that I have found at least, um, it also will hold, you know, uh, it'll hold pins and uh, it, it, you just pull it off when you're done. Um, so, you're gonna use a magnet to create the center. So what I did is I dropped a magnet in here. I left the bead of um, this, of one of these types of pins right here, um, or a quilter's pin, if you will. I left that and I also used it as a spacer, um, sort of like you would if you were uh, tiling or grouting floor. Uh, so literally I, I decided to use that as a spacer. I did not the first time I did the uh, loops and it, it, like I said, it, it was pretty much a It just went on vacation and decided not to come back. All right, so the third thing you're going, thirdly, you're going to do is um, after you've pinned your circles, and I recommend with the Osberg strip, um, with the Osberg chain, is that you just use a T pattern instead of uh, there's a lot of different patterns you can use, but right here, if you use your uh, your pin right here in the middle, you're going to know exactly where the middle is. This is going to be your spacer, and you can have way too many pins because this design here, you're you're going to bleed on it. It will make it a real SCA project because you have bled all over it, um, but you are going to stab yourself and probably other people if they get too close. Um, so uh, in any event, um, that's what I, I would recommend. And I do recommend the longer pins as opposed to the shorter pins, even though there is 
is of course that potential of stabbing yourself, um, mainly just because it helps to really hold it down and hold it in place. Um, so you're going to be, you're going to things like herringbone or um, any, or, you know, any type of other fiber that has this design is that you can literally use this to decide the length of your couching, um, which is really nice because uh, then it doesn't require a lot of thought. Um, you want to couch circles um, basically in a, uh, in a clockwise direction. So once you get here, you're going to do a little bit of an extra and then you're going to go down again. You, you can do both. This way pre presents sort of an opposite of the twist, which is why I usually do it in a uh, clockwise motion um, because it works against it. So it, it crosses over this a little bit uh, instead of cutting into the fiber. If I go this way, I'm cutting right across the twist in that fiber and, and I don't want that because it will separate uh, some. Um, and so what you're going to do is you couch this a couple of times, don't remove your pin and then go in, go back across, couch again, and then you do it the same way going across. Um, so, um, do note that the circles of the Osberg fabric, uh, Osberg do require a thinner fiber. Um, I'm not really good with dimensions at all, um, but basically uh, anything that's a, a thicker, a thicker wool, and I do recommend wool um, as opposed to wild polyester or wild acrylics. Uh, I, but I, I do recommend wool uh, mainly because uh, once you're done with it completely, uh, you can heat set that a little bit uh, with just a tad bit of steam and it will help to kind of hold things down. And that couching fiber will kind of pull a little bit into the fabric without really damaging it. Um, and so it made it makes it a lot easier. Any questions about this? Okay. All right, so. We did have one question on uh, if you spin your own thread, so there car was interested in Want to find out your drafting choices and twist direction implies if you did. Sorry? Car asked, do you spin your own thread? I was wondering about drafting choices and twist direction and plies. Cat, um, sorry. Cat, um, so, um, hold on. I do actually, um, I do actually do my own thread um, in terms of twisting direction. So, um, if you noticed, uh, the, and I, I don't have, I don't have the lingo for what, uh, for, to answer your question in, uh, some, in really good, uh, fiber usage terms in terms of ply, uh, I would use a, at least a four ply, um, for the thickness there, um, in terms of direction, um, whenever I embroider with, um, especially with, um, with wool, usually as I bring it up, I have to retwist. So um, I haven't run into any issues with direction and ply, um, to be honest with you, um, at all. But I do tend to, if you notice, I believe that it twists forward here. And so I've kind of twisted, I, I've sort of done it slightly in the direction of the ply, I believe. I don't know whether I've answered your question. I believe Cass had something to add to that. Yeah, Cass? Yeah, I, I do some spinning for embroidery and tablet weaving. Um, um, let's see here, here's some of what I, I work with. This is, I don't know, about 35, 40 wraps per inch as a two ply. And that, that's what I prefer working with. 
and as far as in direction there's most most evidence is for the opposite of what i do which is let's see here this is uh z plied so it's s spun usually most fibers you find are, are z spun but uh you can pull my top weighted drop spindle out of my cold dead hands yeah yeah you spin all the time <laughs> um so um in terms of uh, two ply versus um, the four ply, I would I typically tend to go with the thickness of uh, of that, and so I guess I guess this is probably more of a four ply. Cass, would you agree with that? Just by eyeballing it, it's fairly thick. Yeah, that that's commercial, so it's probably three or four ply. Um, no, it's actually no. not. No. It is. Well, if that's hand spun, then it's almost always two ply because getting more plies in is just an ever increasing pain in the butt. So it's just, it was, it was, your singles are a little bit thicker. Yeah. I typically use, um, to be honest with you, I use a lot of craft wool for my, uh, with uh, the Viking embroidery. And one of the reasons why I use a lot of craft single skein uh, of, um, of wool and I can use this. I mean, like I can use this whole thing for, for embroidery. And so in terms of, but no, that, that is not, that's not commercial um, at all. My bad. But um, no, it's a, uh, but it is extremely thin and chunky or thick and chunky though. So, all right. So here's me trying to explain how to get that Osberg stitch together. Again, sorry about the sound quality. I don't know whether it'll play. Well, that was exciting, to say the least. Okay, so it should play on the other, on the actual presentation. Um, I don't know why it won't play on this. You could try playing it from the edit view instead of presentation view. On the what view? The editing view for your uh, it should play regardless, but when you're editing the slides themselves, I've seen a funky error happen that way sometimes. All right, here we go. Here we go. Hold on. Bigger. Here we go. All right. Well, all right. I don't know why it's not playing. Uh, um, might be a format PowerPoint doesn't quite like. Uh, if you have the video file elsewhere that's easily accessible, we could just play just directly the file. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll post them up because um, I do have the video files and I'll, I'll send them to you and then they can go up. They're a little bit more because I, I made, as I made them and in terms of even the mistakes that I made, um, you can you can pretty much follow along with what I did. And I, I don't know why this isn't, it was playing earlier on one of the designs, so. Hmm. So going back to slide short. All right. Um, so Were you there, Kemper? All right, I'm gonna pause yeah, until do. she joins. I think so. On people that I care about, so you guys should probably take it as a compliment, maybe. Um, so, all right, so, um, so 
regardless um regarding the stitch and um uh ply etc i think has pretty much answered that um i would say this much is that, and that is that um be very careful with your plies when you're using because like the tablet the ink weaving that i did here it was so sporadic is a good word um and flexible that i i I really had a hard time with it. Um, and that's why I ended up with this nice little border going across it uh, because it it literally, I, it, it kind of went up and down like mountains. Um, so didn't work out as well as I had anticipated. Um, so let's see here. All right, well, here's uh, the uh, some other videos which I'm not gonna play since they're not playing. Um, but I will say this much is that is that especially when you're doing the Osberg stitch, be very, very, very careful of tension. Um, if you pull too much tension, you pull the fabric um, and it makes uneven O's. Uh, and so at the same time, you want enough tension that it helps to hold things you know, down into place. So there's sort of this happy medium between tensions uh, and your fabric. Um, I would also make recommendations uh, that you uh, test out the fabric before you dive in. Um, I dove in and ran into problems. This is hand woven um, uh, wool, uh, twill, diamond twill. Uh, it's a diamond, it's a broken twill um, uh, from uh, woven by Elspeth who used to be on Etsy. She hasn't made anything in a while. She's one of my favorite weavers um, and she makes some beautiful stuff. Um, however, it does, the, the tension on here was, was very difficult to work with um, because I kept pulling it too tight. So that is something to, um, to keep in mind. Um, in terms of, uh, of the plies versus and the and the yarn or fiber versus the weight of the fabric, the one thing that I would say is that um, if you're going to have a couple of heavier fibers, then use just a couple, and after that, make sure you keep with a thinner fiber. If your fabric is thin, basically stay with that thinner fiber because um, you don't want to weigh down or pull the pull that fabric too much. Um, so if you're, you know, I use one heavier, uh, fiber here, um, but I, I tried hard not to on the rest of it. Um, so, so. All right. So this is more, um, free dog hair. Uh, these should play though, hopefully, um, as, uh, going through, but I am, I don't think they're going, I, I just don't think they're going to. All right. All right. So um, basically also continue couching, taking time to adjust with any issues on tension. So you always want to, one thing I did learn is that when I'm making the, when I'm making the Osberg chain with the O's is to go back and double check the tension here and behind to make sure that everything was okay. So it didn't matter that I was just working with this one piece right through. Sorry, you can't hit, see my fingers. Um, it didn't matter that I was working with this one piece, uh, what um, I still had to double check my tension through the rest of these um, back a couple ways just to make them make sure they were much more even. Um, and uh, in any event, um, so just just make sure that you that you uh, keep that in mind. Um, so then. Um, Finally, what I did is added a strip of Osberg silk um, to it, the whole pattern here. And this is just a combination basically of, of the stitches that I've talked about. Um, I've got a running stitch. I've got a herringbone stitch. I've got more herringbone stitches here. Um, I've got herringbone here. Um, we have the whip, some, a whip stitch right in through here. So all of these put together this is in terms of the designs that you can come up with. You can come up with a lot of designs with only the use of just a few stitches. Um, so you don't necessarily have to do anything fancy. Now with the Osberg here, um, what I did is I did actually um, 
do a running stitch um, towards the bottom here to help cover this up. Uh, but I had to attach the silk here onto a ribbon uh, to get so it would stop sliding all over the place. Um, down here at the bottom, you can see this was my original Osberg, and you can see how I've got these nice little squares here and uh, zeros, and I don't know what that is. I think it's a trapezoid, or it wants to be a triangle when it grows up. Um, so this was not this was not done very well um, at all. So this is what I had to take out and put back in again. Um, and so in terms of the um, of doing your stitches, um, my suggestion is to get out there and play. Um, if you're, you know, you can you can do a lot with just those few stitches. Um, and in terms of even with spacing, if you're having a hard time spacing with a running stitch, then you know just uh, you can you can mark something or put a finger there or something a pencil something that helps you do your running stitch um, so that when you're stabbing back down and back up again, um, you're getting some nice good separation between the stitches. Um, and since the, uh, um, since my videos are not running, uh, that really is all I have for you for today. Um, I had, did have some of the, I would really like have liked to have been able to do this by hand uh, or by, in person. But um, any event, is there any, uh, are there any questions about this at all? We did have a couple of earlier questions also from Kat. Um, yeah. Let's see. One was in regards to the herringbone stitch, did you entirely encase the inside seams? Um, sometimes. On some of them I did, I entirely encased them. Um, to give a three dimension and others I actually wove through the herringbone so that it would give it more of a lattice worked type of look um, on some of them, um, especially this one right through here. Uh, yeah, this, this is encased completely in its herringbone. And another question from Kat uh, was, Given the huge number of embroidery stitches and stitch dictionaries, how do you know which stitches were available in this era? Research. Research. Um, a lot of research. Um, the the um, two oldest stitches actually known are a running stitch and scroll stitch. So those have actually gone back um, way into the Egyptian times and, and beyond uh, before. Um, and then they of course had an impact on uh, the medieval world. Um, herringbone stitches uh, can be taken back all the way to obviously the Vikings, the same, same with the Osberg. Um, the Armenian stitch work is a little bit later in period, um, but I went ahead and included it anyway, just because it was a challenge. Um, but in terms of uh, the, there are a lot of really, really good stitch books out there. And I would encourage anybody, there's one, I think it's like the encyclopedia of, of embroidery stitches. Um, but I, I would recommend research in terms of to find out if you are uh, wanting to do, I don't mind fudging, uh, fudging things just a little bit if I, if I like it. And I, Feel it goes together some um, but if you are uh, someone who really wants to recreate definitely based upon stitches that were of that time period on that specific piece of garb I, I really recommend uh, research researching it um, there are some excellent um, um, there's a word for it but there are archaeologists who who delve specifically in uh, in uh, cultural uh, um, embroidery, uh, and I guess it would be archaeo, just archaeologists, um, textiles, um, and that's what I would do is I would research it. Uh, I would not Google it, just Google it. Sorry, I, I Google I'm sure is very exciting, um, but there are a lot of really good period reviews. And if you are in doubt, 
on anything. Um, there are a lot of historians in museums, especially around the world. In, in all honesty, none of them are going to mind if you contact them directly and say, hey, doctor, what's your face? Um, I'm doing research on a specific garment and I uh, wanted to know whether there was any embroidery done at that time. I can't find what I need is, can you, you know, answer my questions at all? Most people, most academics really do enjoy um, reaching out to people who are trying to learn. Um, and especially now that COVID, all of us are teaching hungry. And so we would let, most people would love to talk to people on the phone and reach out even across, you know, the world. Just make sure you don't wake them up and, during their morning cup of tea. Uh, so that's what I do for research is I, I research the stitches to make sure that I've done it. But like I said, um, I, I don't recommend, um, I don't recommend Google or anything. I, I mean, do do some work on um, some stuff. Um, what is it, the academic, what is the academic uh, website? And they have started putting out a lot of uh, peer reviewed articles. Um, and so those are available to people for uh, for free, actually, unless you want to sign up. Um, did that answer your question? Okay. All righty, then I guess that it would be about it. Um, in terms of, I don't have any other, anything else. Um, I, I will say that um, one thing is that to give yourself enough time to do um, any of the any of the work because, like I said, it's it's very labor intensive, um, and uh, but rewarding. And also, it's really great if you could just sit down and like totally binge on Doctor Who while embroidering. Um, so, all right. Any other questions? Agnes, if you're asking a question, we can't hear you. Currently muted. I'm trying. Here you are. There we go. Okay, when you say scroll stitch, are you talking about stem stitch? I know that Shewitt rec uh, mentions uh, pieces from 6th century BC Greece that use stem stitch. Yes, stem stitch, uh, stem stitch, okay. and scroll stitch are about the same. They're the same thing. Oh, okay, I just wanted you know to to, to make sure to make sure. Yeah, because it's like, is there an old stitch? I don't know. <laughs> no, no. Um, that's actually a really good point because um, in terms of doing research. Uh, different places call things different by different names. Yeah. Um, and so it's sort of like hunting down herbs. You know, you, you know, it could be known as chamomile in one town and it could be known as deadly nightshade in another. So, you know, be careful. Um, but um, yeah, so the, yeah, you're right. Um, the uh, scroll stitch and stem stitch goes, goes fairly far back. Um, and uh, there've been some... Uh, some developments in that area that it, it may be even older than that. Yeah, because um, I love Shuett because she goes into, you know, the Greek uh, did the stem stitch, the Persians were doing the chain stitch, and then now I'm like, you you have opened my eyes to the e Egyptians, and I'm like, oh, the Egyptians yeah. were doing embroidery. They were, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and you can find a lot of that. Some of the, um, if you go to the, um, uh, so the uh, British Royal Museum has the Bowdoin Library, and yeah. you can go in, if you can find some of the stuff, um, you can download a lot of the manuscripts, um, but uh, there are some Egyptologists also who have done some really good research on uh, the embroidery of the Egyptian eras. Uh, and, oh. and, and so I would, I would recommend um, checking that, checking that out. Yeah, because that'd be nice just to have that background. Yeah, um, a lot of it is faded and uh, it's, it's difficult for uh, 
um, for them to, um, you know, in terms of the, even with colors, uh, sometimes um, there are ways, of course, with forensics that you can do that. But um, in some of the older areas, uh, just note that there's there's some, you know, there's going to be some fading, et cetera, with colors. But yeah, it can, you can really get down the uh, rabbit hole with that in a big way. And when you were researching, um, you know, it was my understanding that the Vikings didn't, there isn't a lot of clothing evidence right. of what they used. So are you using supposition based on what textiles they have left or? So I'm using suppositions be, or, or I'm using basically what I was doing is um, I looked for uh, specifically even for like this piece here um, was uh, are there any remains? Like what do we have textile wise? What do we have fiber wise that still exists? Um, and uh, going from there. Like, okay. uh, but do note that scholars tend to disagree on just about everything and they're both right and the other one is wrong yeah um on interpretation um what i have actually found to be honest with you to be a lot more reliable is uh, there's a lot of people um who are literally going in and recreating those fibers in those areas sort of like the um, the orkney hood or you had somebody who went in and, and somebody who actually made the Orkney hood and to find out exactly how was it put together? Why was it put together? You know, why are two things longer than another one? You know, to make, uh, to make more sense of it. And so um, the, uh, our, our, um, his, the history itself hasn't changed, but our observations and our analyses of the, that history have a yeah. lot of um, and so, um, you know, and in, in terms of, of, uh, of being, if you are doing something that is more along the purest line, um, then you are also going to look for that era and that, that area. Um, it doesn't, I personally feel that it doesn't mean that somebody wasn't using that. I'm saying there's a possibility, especially with the Silk Road, that um, because the Silk Road is what twenty thousand years old or something, so there's I mean it's it's far older than we thought it was, and so there's a there's a lot out there, um, and uh, so uh, you know sometimes you have to kind of follow your history up to a certain point, and then say okay, you know, yes or no, and, and kind of make that jump. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Those are good questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, any, does anybody else have any other questions? I'm going to, um, I'm going to send a copy of this to um, Elsie and uh, I will send the, um, I guess I'll send the videos uh, here in how do you, how do you want me to send the videos? Do you want me to send them to you for uploading? Um, I will get back to you on it. I believe right. there's a share drive that you can upload them to, but I want to double check that. There, there is Elsie? a share drive, Kemper. I'll add your West Kingdom. Yeah, I'll add your West Kingdom address to it. If we, everything we put in there, Reese will put up on the West Kingdom YouTube. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. All right, so you guys, thank you so much.